Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this crisis group webinar on uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, I am Claudia Gazzini, stepping in for Dina, who today got COVID. I'm the Libya analyst um, for crisis group. Um, this web webinar today will last uh, an hour and 15 minutes. We can extend it a little bit if there are more questions. Um, um, Joining us today for this webinar are my colleagues, Joost Hilterman, uh, the Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa, Tahani Mustafa, our Senior Analyst for Palestine, uh, Merav Zonsain, our Senior Analyst for Israel. Uh, the Crisis Group, as I hope many of you know, is a conflict prevention organization. We are nonpartisan. We produce reports and analysis on and many conflicts around the world and, of course, Israel-Palestine. So, um, so it is very timely that we are today convening and sharing these um, this analysis with you in this format. There is an Arabic translation available. Um, if you want to follow in Arabic, uh, click to the box below your screen. It says translation, select Arabic. And I also advise you to mute. There's an option for mute original uh, language uh, as well. It will just give you a clear Arabic uh, input. If you have questions, there's a question and answer box in your screen. Uh, please write your aff affiliation and your name and your question, and we'll get to it at the uh, in the question and answer part of this uh, webinar. I have to remind you that this uh, conversation is being recorded, recorded, and will be a live stream also on YouTube, where it, be, it will also be available in the following few days. So let's get to it. Um, uh, Jos, I'd like to start with you, if possible. I mean, a lot of has been a lot has been happening since the end of that week-long ceasefire. Uh, um, could you just give us an overview of of what is uh, happening in in the conflict in the region, and uh, what's the conversation uh, in Western capitals as well? Just you are still muted. Yes, this is definitely the case. So hello, everyone, and thank you, Claudia. Um, and thanks for joining. The um, uh, Following on what uh, Claudia started to say about uh, the organization, I just want to mention that uh, in this conflict, like in all conflicts that we cover, we spoke, we speak to all sides. And so um, our the information we are going to convey to you today is very much based on ongoing conversations we have with all the parties to the conflict uh, in the current war in Gaza and more broadly speaking, the Israel-Palestine conflict and in fact, the regional developments. So we, we meet with Israeli officials and diplomats. We meet with the PA uh, and Hamas on the Palestinian side. We meet with Egyptian officials and Jordanian and also uh, representatives of humanitarian organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, since the, the end of the seven day humanitarian pause on December 1st, Israel resumed its uh, attack against Hamas in Gaza uh, with further devastating uh, results. We, we are now seeing uh, catastrophic conditions in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we, uh, the local sources say that over 19,000 people have been killed. Uh, tens of thousands have been, been injured. Some 85% of the Gazan population has become internally displaced, often for more than one time. Uh, access to food, clean water, fuel, and medicines is extremely uh, difficult for most people. Uh, we have a researcher in the Gaza Strip who uh, personally has to go through this. He has been displaced four times uh, from his original home in the Gaza Strip, uh, and um, he has a shelter above his uh, uh, a roof above his head, which is not true for many Gazans, but uh, he has great difficulty finding uh, food in the market at affordable prices. Uh, and, and that is the reality of, mil of, of uh, you know, 2.3 million people in the Gaza Strip. Humanitarian organizations complain of the lack of access to the Gaza Strip. It has improved 
of course, since the uh, humanitarian pause and ongoing, uh, there are trucks going in carrying basic goods. Um, uh, and in fact, Israel has reopened its Kirem Shalom uh, border crossing, which is the one in addition to the Rafah border crossing. These two crossings allow food to come in from, uh, from Egypt. Uh, but uh, as for now, the total volume is still a drop in the bucket of what is actually uh, needed. Uh, from the other side, uh, rockets are still landing in Israel, fired from inside the Gaza Strip. Uh, they are not uh, reaching as far as uh, earlier during the conflict. Um, and, and most of them are landing in uh, sparsely populated areas, so haven't had any ca caused any casualties, uh, but, but they are continuing to fall. Um, Israel has designated certain areas in southern Gaza as uh, so-called safe zones. The United Nations has condemned these zones as being inherently unsafe, um, and people, Palestinians, who are flocking toward the south uh, have both come to these areas and to other areas uh, in search of uh, safe shelter, but they're not finding uh, any uh, in, in the entire uh, territory. Some uh, are less uh, targeted in bombardments than others, but uh, essentially any area can be bombed at any given time, according to local uh, eyewitnesses. Thousands now are especially massed close to the Egyptian border and are fearing uh, a mass expulsion or a mass need to leave because of the fact that uh, uh, the, the Gaza Strip generally uh, but, and all areas of it are, are becoming increasingly unlivable. Um, of course, much of the housing has been uh, destroyed or severely damaged. We're talking about at least 60% of the housing stock. There have been calls for a ceasefire. And in fact, it is being discussed even as we speak uh, at the UN, UN uh, Security Council. It looks like the resolution that is on the table today uh, will be vetoed by the United States, but we have to wait and see what will happen um, if the ceasefire doesn't, uh, if there is no call for a ceasefire, then uh, this will make it very difficult to, to see a ceasefire. What we could see, though, is uh, another humanitarian pause or a pause that would allow for the two sides, Israel and Hamas, to exchange hostages and prisoners. Um, because these negotiations are happening, of course, separately from the UN conversations in New York. Um, finally, because you asked me about the region as well, we're seeing a barely contained escalation in the region, be it on the border between Israel and Lebanon, involving Hezbollah and other groups in Lebanon, and of course Israel, um, also involving uh, Iran-backed groups in Iraq and Syria, uh, and of course, the Houthi rebels in uh, in in Yemen, who have been firing uh, drones or and, and rockets at uh, commercial shipping in the Red Sea. All of this is raising the temperature throughout the region. Uh, but for now, um, it doesn't look like uh, it is going to escalate tremendously. Though um, accidents can happen. Uh, miscalculations are easily made in a situation of such great tension. And so we should be alert to, uh, to anything that could explode anywhere and then uh, have a domino uh, effect. I'll leave it at this and um, over back to you, Claudia. Thank you, Joost. Um, I'll, I'll turn to Meirav now. Meirav, can you just give us a feeling of what the mood is uh, in Israel, what uh, the public is saying? And and how, on the official level, um, the stated goal of uh, waging a war to eradicate uh, Hamas um, is is playing out? Yeah, so, I mean, Israel is still committed to the its two main goals, which are the dismantling of Hamas, the kind of incapacitation of its military capacity, as well as its governance of the Strip. You could argue in some ways because of the chaos that it's already managed to at least debilitate its ability to operate the hospitals and, and the civil infrastructure, which has been destroyed. Um, the other one is to return the hostages. And that's something that the Israeli public is very focused on. I don't think they understand if and how Israel will be able to attain the first goal, but they are very determined that Israel attain the second goal, which is the hostage release. 
Um, and what we're seeing is kind of a fog of war where Israel has been trying to build some kind of victory narrative in a very incremental way. It's basically been using a various degrees of tactical achievements to try to build um, some kind of success. And also Netanyahu has said as, as recently as today and yesterday that Israel is not going to stop. Now, it's interesting that he said to the families of the hostages yesterday, which he also doesn't always agree to meet with when they ask for it, he said yesterday, I can't guarantee, he said something like, uh, I don't know if we'll win, but I can guarantee we will not stop. Uh, so he kind of essentially said, this is might be an endless war. And everybody knows that Netanyahu has an interest in prolonging this war and dragging it out. A, because of his own political survival, because many Israelis agree that they would like an election once this war is done. And B, because it's highly likely that Netanyahu even himself knows that a victory, a clear victory may not happen in this war. Um, so even just, and then there was of course the tragedy last Friday where three Israeli hostages who had managed to break free and were apparently outside shirtless, waving some kind of white cloth and they were shot and killed by IDF soldiers. I mean, this is something that has really shifted even more so the despair in Israel to uh, despair, grief, to also impatience and anger. Um, and so now you're seeing a renewed kind of call and negotiations, and the head of the Mossad is now back in talks with the Qatari PM and with the CIA head, and Egypt is involved. And so all of a sudden, in the last few days, we're seeing a resurgence of this. I suspect, while it's very possible that it could lead to some outcome of a pause, I suspect that Netanyahu tried also to kind of accelerate this in the last few days in order to put you know, to appease the Israeli public, which is very, very upset and really sees no end in sight. Um, and, and, you know, last week, the defense minister talked about how, I mean, Israel has been saying for weeks now that the northern Gaza Strip is almost under its complete control. We've heard this over and over again, even the last few days, we're almost there, we're about to do it. And then a day after he said that 10 Israeli soldiers were killed in the highest daily death toll for soldiers in this war so far, nine of them in an ambush uh, by Hamas in Shajaiya. Um, so we're kind of hearing that things are moving, uh, but then we don't actually see much on the ground. I mean, as far as numbers, uh, Israel has lost a total of about 450 soldiers, including on October 7th. Since the ground operation, it's lost 130. Uh, there's several thousand casualties, and they claim to have killed something like 8,000 or so Hamas militants. We don't know. That's an estimate. Um, even if that is correct, that's, you know, the, the ratio of how many, which is 20,000 now killed, doesn't seem to be a lot or enough uh, to dis, you know, dismantle. And also to think about the fact that in this war, you know, Israel is not used to, to being in such long and, and, and difficult wars. Uh, it's unprecedented um, on this in this level in Gaza. And, you know, you have soldiers who are going in and even one casualty of a soldier because of, you know, an RPG or or something like that is a, is a huge loss on the Israeli side. And for Hamas, they just want to survive. So, you know, it's the same thing with the rockets. It's like it just takes one rocket to put a lot of people into um, into a sense of, uh, you know, threat and trauma. Um, and, it, you know, Hamas still has those rockets and it can do that for quite a long time. So Israel basically is having a hard time uh, showing that it's it's on its way to victory. And in a sense, we're in a pattern now where it just seems to say the one thing that we're hearing all the time, Israeli officials told this to the American officials this week, is that we need months and months and this will take a long time and that we don't we don't see the end right now. Uh, well, I see. I mean, from what you're saying, I see a, a, a difficulty in in. Um, in this Israeli uh, conviction of continuing the war that will take months and months. And on the other side, have, hearing uh, Hamas saying uh, that the only condition to to free more hostages is to have a cessation of hostility. So it's it's difficult to, to find a compromise point between, uh, between those two sides. But I'll turn to Tahani now, if you can, Tahani, I mean, can you can you give us a sense of what's happening as well on the ground specifically? I mean, we heard from Yost a bit about the situation inside Gaza, but if you want to add more, um, but also what's happening in the West Bank, we hear of um, a lot of um, uh, developments there, not positive at all, in, and in East Jerusalem. And what's the mood uh, amongst Palestinians today? Thanks, Claudia. Uh, 
So I think Yost really summed up quite well uh, the situation in Gaza in terms of the uh, dire humanitarian uh, catastrophe we've seen, uh, not to mention the fact that we're seeing Gazans being pushed into smaller and smaller pockets um, of what are being labelled as safe zones, uh, never mind the mention of, of potential population displacement, given the fact that Gaza has no longer the infrastructure to accommodate 2.3 million people. Um, and this is something that obviously the Jordanians have been warning about since the outset when we had the Jordanian foreign minister come out and, and declare any intention to or any attempt to displace uh, Gazans or the population within the West Bank as a declaration of war. This was something that the Palestinians had been warning about and something that Israeli politicians had been calling for. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that at some at some stage uh, displacement may be seen as the solution. Uh, especially given, uh, as I said, the uh, you know massive massive scale of destruction to civilian infrastructure. Uh, you know, never mind the fact that um, at the moment there's the concern now amongst uh, international organisations that at some point uh, the deaths from starvation and disease could start to outnumber those from Israeli military action. Uh, something that uh, even you know prominent human rights organisations like Human Rights Watch have have, have warned about now. And so given the option of, of as to whether to stay and die of starvation and disease or move uh, or, you know, uh, relocate to the Sinai, potentially, uh, I'm pretty sure Gazans would end up choosing the latter, which is what we've seen uh, from the north and the central, where even our own analyst, as you mentioned, who's on the ground, had that very difficult decision to make and was very adamant until the last minute to relocate from central Gaza until he absolutely had to. Uh, in the West Bank, we're seeing settlers... Uh, as well as Israeli security forces uh, empowered by the new emergency laws that have been in place since the 7th of October. We've seen a lot of trends that we as crisis group were warning about prior to the 7th of October, like the increase in settler violence, uh, the increase of, of Israeli uh, incursions, search and arrest operations, targeted assassinations um, that have been on the rise since May 2021 after the unity in the father and the cross-border conflict. Um, and where, uh, in response to that, we started to see the establishment of what began as community defense mechanisms against Israeli raids um, turned into uh, this kind of proliferation or phenomenon of armed groups. Um, now, the situation had been fairly quiet between July after the last severe uh, Israeli raid in, in Janin that effectively uh, almost eradicated what was left of these groups until the 7th of October. Um, since then, we've now seen uh, Palestinian militancy on the rise once again, but again, they take a very defensive posture against uh, what are becoming, uh, you know, um, incredibly uh, uh, violent Israeli raids across the West Bank. So you're no longer talking about areas where they were quite prominent to start with for the last two years in the north. These have now proliferated across the West Bank. So you're talking about um, south, center, and, and as well as the northern West Bank. Um, we've seen since the 7th of October something like 297 Palestinians killed in the West Bank, over 3,000 injured. We've seen mass arrest campaigns, uh, again, very similar to, to what we saw after the unity in the Father in May 2021, where Israel went on a preemptive uh, uh, campaign of, of trying to strike down pockets of resistance. Um, on this scale, we're now seeing Palestinians not only engaged in resistance, but also just on the basis of political expression that can include something as benign as liking a Facebook post that can warrant your arrest and detention, uh, indefinite uh, detention. Uh, we did see something of a prisoner exchange during the humanitarian pause, but many of those that were released have now been rearrested. Um, we've also seen, generally speaking, I mean, life was very difficult prior to the 7th of October in the West Bank, given uh, the constant closures, given the limitations of, of Palestinian movement uh, due to land wolf attacks and, uh, um, and in some cases clashes with armed groups now that, that um, sorry, now that those processes have accelerated. So we've seen uh, makeshift checkpoints uh, set up across the West Bank, effectively cutting off huge segments. I mean, the, the PA's administrative center has effectively been cut off from the north. Um, we're, you know, we've seen the, the impact of that um, in, in terms of the economy, but unfortunately there hasn't been um, any sufficient research done given the lack of access. So in, in, in order to determine the actual economic impact of that, I don't think that's something we're really going to be able to, to fully determine until, uh, until at some point Israel, uh, you know, removes, removes some of that, uh, some of those restrictions. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately for, for Palestinians now, there is a, a there is this sense of collective trauma 
that is essentially the the atmosphere there, collective trauma, fear. Um, you know, many Palestinians, especially communities that are being targeted either by settler militias that are now preventing um, exit and entry into Palestinian areas in areas A and sorry B and C, um, and even those residing within areas A. Uh, will tell you that, you know, much of what they're seeing now feels less like a military objective and more like a psychological um, attempt to, to, to make it very clear to Palestinians that any kind of pushback, any resistance will not be tolerated. Um, you know, whether that's going to have the adverse effect that Israel um, is intending, whether this makes Israelis any safer, I think that's something we will, we will determine in the longer term. Uh, but for now, I think Palestinians are both in Gaza and in the West Bank are on sheer survival mode. Thank you. Well, we didn't talk about the Palestinians inside Israel, but maybe I'll get back to you on that uh, at a, at a, uh, in the next round. I wanted to go back to um, to to Yost. Um, well, with all, with all of this happening, what are the prospects for a ceasefire? I mean, we we published a, a briefing uh, just ten days ago, and I'd be grateful if our support staff could share in the in 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 the chat function the link to that uh, briefing. Um, but what is there and what uh, is there a way out for for this war and uh, what are the steps needed? Well, there has to be a way out, Claudia. And and, um, and of course, uh, a year from now, we'll see what the way out was. Um, I just hope that it's not the worst case scenario that we can envision right now, which is, in fact, the mass displacement of uh, Palestinians from Gaza into Egypt, into the Sinai Desert. Um, because this would uh, up destabilize the entire Middle East uh, and could really lead to a major escalation by uh, non-state actors allied with Iran uh, against uh, various US and Israeli interests, uh, and which of course would be met with uh, a, a violent response. So um, we, we I think the, the importance of coming to a ceasefire cannot be uh, stressed enough uh, because it not only is it absolutely critical uh, for the survival of people in Gaza and to be able to stay in Gaza, but it's also the only way to prevent a major escalation beyond the immediate uh, borders of uh, Israel slash Palestine. Um, and so, um, but the prospect of it is 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 minor. I said uh, is is not great. I said earlier already that um, there are international discussions about this. The United States is still is going to play. Uh, uh, the main role in this, uh, for better or for worse, it's going to, it's only pressure from the United States in concert with other states that could bring Israel to agree to a, a to a halt to the fighting and the start of a political process. Um, we are not there yet, clearly. Um, I think uh, the United States is still supporting Israel in its objective to uh, to defeat and dis destroy, dismantle, whatever word you want to choose, uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Uh, we don't know if that is a realistic objective. We do know that uh, so far um, that objective has been tantamount to this, the destruction of Gaza uh, and, and, the, and the potential uh, uh, displacement of uh, Gazans uh, outside the territory. Um, there is there are discussions now between the head of the Mossad, David Barnier, uh, and um, the Americans, I think the CIA director, Bill Burns, and the foreign minister of Qatar to come to a new uh, agreement on an exchange of prisoners and hostages. Uh, this, of course, is, is always welcome. Uh, and like the last time, we would hope uh, that uh, it could be built upon to, to uh, come to a wider agreement that didn't happen last time. Uh, this time we will have to see the pressure may mount on both sides. Um, I am not encouraged by what I'm seeing. Uh, both Israel and Hamas seem to be uh, uh, hesitant to move towards, well, certainly Israel is made clear, as uh, Merav said earlier, in uh, Benjamin and Prime Minister Netanyahu's words, is, uh, is not uh, uh, prepared to end this war, but also our impression from Hamas is that they uh, want to continue uh, simply because um, they can. And um, uh, and for them, you know, uh, I think it's very important to point out that uh, each side may have a victory narrative, but they're clearly very different definitions of victory. And, um, and it seems to Hamas, I think, 
that uh, it can hold out much longer. And still, uh, despite uh, all the losses that we've seen, which, as I said, were devastating, it could still retrieve some kind of victory from this. Uh, and uh, and that is why it would not be motivated to move toward a, a ceasefire now. But let us see. Um, let's keep our fingers crossed for a humanitarian pause and then uh, work from there. I think uh, um, there's really no other way to move forward uh, than that. Thank you, Jo. So one step at a time. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we have that next step uh, soon rather than later. Uh, Mayrav, uh, I'd like to turn back to, to you. I mean, we heard from you earlier um, um, uh, what you said about uh, this war, what Netanyahu was saying about the war has to continue. Um, but are there, uh, and we heard about the families, uh, you know, wanting a, a hostage exchange or a release of the, of, of the hostages. Um, but what else is being articulated inside Israel about the prospects uh, and the steps needed to end the war? Are there other voices that are, that are worth uh, highlighting or, or are there other thoughts uh, about what should should be happening? And how influential is the U.S. in, um, in, in limiting or influencing uh, Israel's decision making? Honestly, from where I stand, I haven't seen much of that influence, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, as I said before, um, there are Israeli public opinion is there is a consensus that they you they cannot coexist with Hamas uh, in the south, and you know there are over a hundred thousand Israelis displaced internally uh, in the south. They're being put up in hotels. Uh, you know, think about a family in in one room for months and no idea when they're going to go back home. The school system is out of whack. So there is you know, a, a certain level. On the one hand, they want Hamas to be defeated. On the other hand, they have no idea how long it's going to take. Um, and I think for them, it's also the sense of security. And you have to remember also, as opposed to other wars in other countries, there's no popularity for the government. There's no trust in the government. There was already mass protests against this far-right government. And now there's simply no trust. And so they kind of are stuck in this place where they want this government to change, but they also want to defeat what they see as the enemy. And so I think Israelis are kind of stuck. And then you also have a far right, which is pushing very openly. And the rhetoric that we're hearing from the people in charge uh, has to do with, uh, it, you know, Palestinian expulsion, wiping Gaza out, um, and also resettling Gaza. You have movements of settlers uh, that are more and more normalized in Israel. Uh, that are talking about building uh, settlements again in Gaza. And that comes from a concept that is quite mainstream in Israel, which is that you put people on the ground, you get more security because you you create a new front. Um, so this is something that you know should not be ruled out either. You have this type of uh, far right uh, pull, and I, you know I'm hoping that that has absolutely no chance of happening. But I do think we're seeing a de facto occupation or entrenchment of occupation or reoccupation, however you see it, of Gaza. And I think that the Israeli military, as they state, will need to have security control. And so there's, you know, there's going to be fatigue and you have soldiers dying every day. I don't know how long Israel is going to, you know, feel like it can go, go through with this, especially if it's not getting anything kind of in return. Um, so that's on, on that level. Uh, but again, like if... If there were a big hostage release, if Israelis were able to start going back to the south, I think for, for most Israelis, that would be an articulation of some kind of end, some kind of victory, and maybe then they would turn their attention to replacing Netanyahu. Um, as far as the U.S. involvement, I mean, I, I think that we can sum up how we've understood it to be that the U.S. has pushed Israel to fight a more humane war, kind of in the same way that it has pushed for decades for Israel to I don't know, have a more enlightened occupation in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So, you know, I haven't seen much effect of the U.S. pressure. I do think that there is a strategy by the U.S. to kind of, and we know that Biden is a Zionist and he is very much supportive of Israel and very much supportive of its military objective. So I, I don't expect Biden to change on this, but I think he has his own interests, right? And so his interests have to, and, you have to understand he also doesn't trust Netanyahu, even though he puts faith in Israel's objectives, right? He came to Israel 11 days after this war started while there were rockets and sat in the war cabinet. So for many Israelis, that was considered a huge sign of support, which I guess it was, but it was also a signal that I don't trust the people here and I need to come and tell them, you know, how to kind of manage this war. So, you know, for me, 
the US involvement has been in trying to warn about urban warfare, warn about getting stuck uh, in Gaza and trying to you know, decrease the civilian casualties. However, I don't think the US has been very successful in that. And I also think that Netanyahu has his own interests in pushing against Biden right now. I mean, he said it in a meeting recently that, you know, an Israeli prime minister needs to stand up to American pressure. And he's kind of like Yost mentioned is already in a re-election campaign, or I don't know if he mentioned it, but he Netanyahu is constantly in an election campaign. He's constantly interested in his political survival. And so he's actually pandering to a base that thinks it's good to stand up to Biden in some weird way, even though he's probably the most pro-Israel president that Israel has ever had. Um, so, you know, and then on, on in terms of the post-war stuff, right, the, the day after stuff, I mean, the U.S. has been pushing Israel to kind of devise a better plan, and they've been meeting with PA officials. But I don't think that the U.S. itself, even though it needs, it understands the need for such a plan, I don't know if it has a good plan itself, right? Uh, this notion of a rejuvenated PA, how would that happen, what, the, what that would look like, um, and kind of, you know, reinvigorating these uh, PA forces in Gaza does not seem very realistic right now. Um, so... You know, it could be that behind closed doors, the U.S. is putting a lot more pressure for something to happen at some point. But what we're seeing on the ground is that the U.S. is completely complicit in the destruction of Gaza. Um, and I know it could be that where the U.S. pressure will or is already coming into more effect is on the regional issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis the border with Lebanon and, and, and other regional actors, uh, which we can maybe get into later. Thank you. So I'll turn, I mean, you raised those questions of, you know, what are these conversations with the PA and other Palestinian representatives? Uh, what shape do they take? So I'll, I'll turn that question over to, to Hani. Can you, can you uh, break it a bit down for us, what these various uh, Palestinian factions or representatives uh, are articulating in terms of the steps towards a ceasefire or maybe even after the ceasefire, what the governance of Gaza um uh, can look like and how to address the humanitarian needs um, of Palestinians today? I mean, the PA have, have, have come out to claim that, uh, I mean, from the outset, we saw the PA Prime Minister come out and claim that, uh, you know, any post-war uh, solution has to include some kind of solution involving Hamas, right? So they immediately ruled out this idea that uh, Hamas can be dislodged, um, you know, and that's I mean, that's quite significant in the sense that Fatah and Hamas are very bitter rivals. So for Fatah to actually openly admit that Hamas is not an actor that you can any longer ignore um, is 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 somewhat revelationary, given that, you know, again, it's very indicative of the kind of juncture that they saw this heading in. Um, at the same time, you know, we've we've seen um, slight discourse within the PA, within the top tier of Fatah. You've seen people like Dahlan come out openly criticizing Mahmoud Abbas's um, stringent uh, lack of ability to to reconcile the differences between the two factions. You know, he took uh, he took the blame for for Hamas's rise to power, but ultimately laid uh, whatever subsequently followed up until the moment we've reached now today um, at, at the door of Mahmoud Abbas and and the lack of political will from the top tier. Um, you know, we've largely seen the PA, other than that, being completely marginalized from uh, international discussions around the day after. Uh, you know, in many cases, you haven't had a single Palestinian in the room when discussing post-war uh, scenarios. Uh, what has happened is that the international community have come to the Palestinians proposing ideas where the PA have then had to rule them out as, as non-viable. Not that they don't necessarily support the initiative. From the outset, the PA um, in some ways would favor some kind of dismantlement of Hamas because it means a stronger PA, an unrivaled uh, Palestinian authority and Fatah. But the reality is, is, is something completely different. And they recognize that Hamas is not a movement that you can simply just dislodge. Hamas is more than just um, an armed wing, right? It's a political movement. It has its uh, strands within the West Bank externally, uh, as, as well as Gaza. Um, and even then, there is a context that gives rise to or, or gives relevance to Hamas um, and, and radical ele sorry, elements like it. And as long as that context exists, you're not going to be able to get rid of um, those more radical elements. And if anything, current opinion polls are reflecting just that, given that the rise of support, not of Hamas as a governing authority or its politics, but Hamas as, an, as a resistance movement. Um, and something that really wasn't, um, and this was something that ICG was trying to advocate for over the last 
uh, year where we've been looking at these armed groups is that there is there, there was a clear phenomenon beginning to emerge, which is that there was this huge disconnect between Fatah's constituency base uh, and its leadership. And what was happening was that much of its constituency base was beginning to be um, somewhat influenced by more radical elements like Islamic Jihad, like Hamas. And they were turning to, to things like the support of or engagement of armed resistance. And that should have been um, somewhat of an indicator in terms of where things are heading and how bad things are. But that was completely, you know, uh, ignored almost and solutions to that problem again this were, this was an incredibly deeply political problem that required political solutions and yet what you had was technocratic solutions being brought forward in a very securitized framework and that's exactly now what you're seeing with regards to post-war planning for gaza and so any proposal that has been introduced is not viable. It doesn't meet the needs and, and, and wants of Palestinians, which is uh, an end to the intensification of Israel's campaign, um, an end to obviously the, the, the occupation and its brutality, and some kind of political horizon, a recognition that they are a people that deserve, that are deserving of their political rights, which is something that in retrospect now, if you look back to, to the Oslo process, all the way to what is now being offered to Palestinians on the table today, is not that. It is not a recognition of their political rights at all. If anything, the, the international community and Israel continue to engage with Palestinians as though they are a problem to be managed. Um, and that is something that 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 does, in fact, unite differing factions across Palestinians. They may be divided on a lot of issues, but I think in that sense, that is one unifying thread that you will find uh, within their divisions. Um, and so ultimately, you know, any kind of post-war planning at the moment is just sheer fantasy if it does not include um, any kind of political substance for, for, for in terms of implementing or, or imposing a Palestinian leadership on Palestinians. You have, you know, proposals, as Mayor have outlined um, uh just now uh, in terms of you know implementing a revived PA um you know so, so that it can, it can conduct its administrative tasks like um, service provision uh, you know health education um sanitation uh imposing a UN interim UN uh, uh, mission which the UN has been reluctant in terms of supporting given its experience um in in previously doing something similar back in in Lebanon in the 80s um and, and the blowback that then hit its own personnel um you know the, the other option uh has been giving uh Arab states some kind of responsibility over over Gaza again something Arab states themselves don't want any part in not you know not, not necessarily out of good conscience but because they recognize the, the problems involved in that, not only in terms of abetting and managing Israel's occupation, but also the discord that can then sow at home. And so again, in all of that, where are Palestinians, right? Where are their political rights? Where, where, where is their, you know, where is a leadership that can effectively advocate them? All the while, Israel retains full control over the Gaza Strip, um, similar to the arrangement that you now see in the West Bank. Uh, so I think, you know, I'll, it, right now, ultimately, um, in terms of where Palestinians stand, I think I think now, you know, it, it really is about trying to find effective leaderships that they can rally behind an effective unified leadership. And unfortunately, um, you know, you would need elections for that. You would need elections to, to create some kind of credible leadership. And they don't have the space for that. They're not being given the space for that. So I. Uh, I hear you when you, when you say political rights, but I have I didn't hear you uh, articulate whether by political rights we we mean the creation of the Palestinian state uh, or not. And so I wanted to ask you. I mean, as the war, and we, we've been hearing that from from uh, Arab leaders, right? From 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 Jordanians, from the Egyptians, and others saying, you know, at the end of the day, the solution is the two state solution. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, and and because there are differing views on this on what it if this war in Gaza goes on for longer and if we see more devastation does that put um the you know the the obtainment of those political rights as you articulated or the the, the Palestinian state as others articulated does that push the chances of that um further away or will we have more regional pressure would that will make the uh, the political horizon, um, uh, that political objective easier to achieve? I mean, I don't think the discussion is any longer about a one state, two state. Uh, right now, a lot of Palestinians will, will argue that what you have now 
is de facto a one state reality. Um, I mean, ultimately, these discussions are meaningless given that no Israeli administration has ever been pressured to recognize um, the existence of Palestinians. And as I said earlier, they've always been seen as a simple problem to be managed. Um, but in terms of their political rights, whether in a one state or a two state, um, again, these scenarios are completely meaningless until Palestinians are recognized um, as a people that are entitled to those rights. Um, otherwise, Israel can easily repress them, which is what they are doing now um, with its Arab population in a one state as it can, which it is currently doing now in the occupied territories in a two state. Where even if we did have a two state scenario, which is what everyone's pushing for, again, going back to the default setting, um, Palestinians will never be granted access and freedom to their own resources, land, air, sea space. Uh, you'll continue to see uh, Palestinian uh, access to their land diminish. Freedom of, or sorry, freedom of movement, basic basic rights diminish, which is what we've seen over the last three decades, and which is what has led us to the current predicament we're in today. Great, uh, very clear, um, albeit uh, sad. So, Mayra, um, I wanted to turn uh, to you because there's a lot happening also uh, on the northern border uh, of Israel. Uh, so, I wanted to broaden a bit the, this conversation. Um, uh, there's ongoing escalation. Um, how how can this escalation be mitigated? W what is the discourse within Israel uh, about how to deal with that northern front? Yeah, so uh, Hezbollah started firing um, uh, on Israeli in the, the border region, and it has expanded since uh, since October eighth. And we basically had what most Israelis would consider a war up north. Uh, now, obviously, it's below the threshold of war the way we understand it, uh, the way it was in 2006. And Israel and Lebanon, or Hezbollah specifically, have enjoyed a certain relative calm uh, up until up until now, since 2006. Um, I have been speaking to Israeli officials for, for a while now about the notion of deterrence and what would tip the balance. And now that we have the Gaza war, it's quite clear that uh, Hezbollah is interested, as is Israel, in ke keeping this below the threshold of war. Um, however, the escalation keeps the risk up. And just like we have in the south, we have in the north also around 100,000 Israelis who are displaced. Um, and in many ways, those Israelis are even more concerned about their situation than those uh, down by, by Gaza, because they really have no idea. It's not like just now we're starting to hear about some diplomacy around how to kind of implement um, what would be Resolution 1701, which is what ended the 2006 war. Um, but up until now, there's been very little done except for tit for tat strikes. Um, now, Israel has uh, been doing what it calls offensive defense uh, in the north. Um, and I think it's taken something like 100 Hezbollah uh, militants out. Um, and this is just this just continues daily. I mean, you have daily rocket sirens, daily all kinds of things being shot over. And essentially, the people who are displaced, as well as the security officials, are saying that it needs there needs to be a change that we cannot go back to the status quo ante. Um, now, the the problem is that this new security situation would have to be enforced. And we know that the Lebanese forces and that UNIFIL are not really able to do that and that we've seen a deterioration of 1701 by Hezbollah since 2006. So you have a situation in which it's unclear even if Hezbollah did agree to some kind of moving back up to above the Litani River, which is what Israel is demanding. It's unclear who would enforce that and how that would work and whether Israelis would feel secure to, to move back there. Um, but it should be said that both sides do not seem interested in, and I don't think Israel has an appetite um, for opening a second front. It could be that it will feel that it's necessary to do some kind of kinetic action once the Gaza war is somehow more contained or died down or ends. Um, you know, there is rhetoric uh, among some Israeli officials, the prime minister, the defense minister will, will turn Beirut into Gaza. They say these things, but when I talk to Israeli officials who are, you know, kind of having to deal with the day-to-day -day of how to strategize, they, they're they not talking uh, on that level. They are saying that uh, there's going to be a need for continued unilateral enforcement. In other words, military strikes to protect uh, the border. 
um, and diplomacy. And so I think Israel ideally would want there to be uh, uh, tons of engagement by various forces, the US, Arab states, in order to try and enforce or you know, recreate a 1701 resolution. Um, but I think most people realistically un understand that that might be very difficult. So the question is what kind of military action would happen and how risky would it be and would it escalate? Um, and that's something that, you know, the U.S. I think is very invested in preventing um, and it has brought its, you know, weaponry and ships here in order to prevent that because that would be a, a true catastrophe. Um, and you have to also remember that Israeli soldiers are overstretched right now. They don't have the capacity, I think, to really take on um, a new war with uh, Hezbollah. So, uh, you know, the more the faster we get to a ceasefire, which Hezbollah did abide by in that week's long uh, pause, the faster we get to a ceasefire, the less, you know, threats, the, the more likely it is that all of this will come to an end. Um, and then the question is, you know, how will Israel re recreate its understanding of security on the border? Uh, thank you, Mayra, because you also addressed one of the questions from our audience about the Litani uh, River and uh, uh, and the odds of uh, IDF sort of um, uh, invading uh, Lebanon. So thank you. But uh, last question from me to to Yos, and then we'll open it up to the question and answers. Um, and let me remind the people who are uh, writing questions and answer to please put your affiliation as well. Uh, um, thank you. But uh, for Yost, I mean, we heard what's happening on that northern Israeli front. What, what else is happening in the in the region that we and and who's following this webinar should should be uh, aware of um, uh, in terms of escalation and the risk of a broadening regional uh, war. So, so I think the interesting thing is that that the um, the escalation would come from uh, from mainly from uh, the side of the uh, so-called axis of resistance, which is a coalition of Iran, uh, Syria, and non-state actors like Hezbollah and uh, Al Hashd al-Shaabi in Iraq or various parts of that, uh, and the uh, Houthi Ansarallah. Uh, rebels in in Yemen. Uh, all of them have been actively engaged in uh, sending rockets. Uh, in fact, there was even a, an armed incursion of Jordan uh, yesterday that was um, uh, inter intercepted by the Jordanian authorities um, uh, by fighters that are carrying uh, uh, weaponry. But uh, in any case, um, there, there, there clearly is an attempt by that particular alliance to keep the heat on. Uh, as long as the conflict uh, in Gaza continues. But as uh, Meraf pointed out, um, uh, when the humanitarian pause occurred in late November, those groups also suspended their activities. So they clearly are seeing their own uh, involvement as, as a function of the uh, continuation of the war in Gaza. Should the war happen, uh, sorry, end tomorrow, then Presumably, but I, there's no way you know, of knowing for sure until then, but uh, they would also end their, their activities. And the reason is this, um, that particular alliance, uh, which is uh, steered, uh, funded, uh, equipped, trained by Iran, um, is not ready for an all-out confrontation at this stage. All the signals are that they are not ready. Uh, and in fact, um, we understand that the Iranian leadership and that uh, Hezbollah's leadership were quite peeved, to put it mildly, about uh, Hamas's attack on October 7th that occurred without uh, Hamas notifying them uh, and seeking their green light or yellow light or whatever, uh, some kind of tolerance of it. Um, and also we, we found out from Hamas in, in, in Doha that um, they're quite angry. At at uh, at Iran and and uh, Hezbollah, vice versa, because uh, they did not join Hamas after October seventh in standing up uh, for for this uh, cohesive alliance, which uh, Hamas thought was a cohesive alliance, but which turns out to be uh, maybe somewhat cohesive in terms of the links that exist, but not in terms of the timing uh, and uh, and uh, well, mainly the timing of any attack. Uh, against uh, Israel or, or U.S. interests in the region, which they've made very clear they would like to see disappear from the region. Um, and it, it seems, therefore, that this, this alliance is essentially a defensive one as part of Iran's uh, forward defense strat strategy. 
that Iran would like to activate when it feels under immediate threat from Israel or the United States, but is otherwise not ready to activate um, because some actor, member of that alliance, uh, out of its own interests, like Hamas on October 7th, felt moved to, to attack Israel. Um, that is just not part of the agenda at the moment. The real problem and the real challenge is that this is very, they're playing a very dangerous game. Um, so much can go wrong. Uh, any rocket, uh, let's say rocket, uh, that falls on an urban area and causes significant civilian casualties would lead the enemy uh, or the, the victim of the attack uh, to to lash out in response, and then you you come you you're faced with the prospect of an a pot potentially uncontrollable escalation that could uh, affect the, or infect the larger region. So that is the that I think is the real danger. The other thing is the longer the war in Gaza lasts, the more that risk continues and possibly goes up, uh, because uh, Iran and its allies have made clear that there are red lines. Now we don't know how firm those red lines are. Uh, but uh, uh, in response to a question by Paul Arts in the, in the comments, um, you know, there, there's no way of predicting that uh, things would get out of hand if, if the Gazan population is displaced to Egypt, for example. But it is a red line for these groups. Uh, and of course, it is a red line for Egypt as well and for Jordan, by the way. So um, uh, it is certainly not a stabilizing factor and it's, it is definitely a destabilizing one. Um, and and so uh, all bets are off, frankly, uh, when that happens. Um, nothing is certain. Nothing is should we should take for granted that there will be um, a regional war as a result of the displacement of Gazans into 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 Egypt. Uh, but I certainly think that the risk will go up um, because this alliance it may have its own internal uh, motivation, but it also may be forced into uh, to act uh, simply because to to preserve its own credibility in front of its. Uh, fighters and supporters, uh, and because it may just get dragged into it. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. Uh, so I'll um, uh, ask a question to Mayra, uh, a question that comes from the audience also, because I know Mayra may have to leave us for just a few minutes during the Q&A. So Helen Lackner asks, uh, what is the likelihood of Israelis removing Netanyahu as PM uh, as the war goes on? I mean, I think the understanding for now is that Israelis will, will push for some kind of either election or there might be a re, rebuilding of the coalition if the far right is pushed out. Uh, but that would only happen at the end of the war. But that's where it gets tricky, because what is the end of the war? How does the end of the war look like? Who will decide that the, the war has ended, especially if it kind of goes on in various phases for quite a while? It could be nonlinear and there's breaks. So it's it's hard to tell. But what I can say for sure is that the the Israeli public and especially the families of the hostages are absolutely they hold Netanyahu responsible for October 7th and for what has happened since. Um, they don't trust the leadership. Um, and, you know, they there's even a. Um, Something that happened yesterday where a uh, national uh, security minister, Itamar ben -Vir, from the far right Jewish power party, um, he showed up to one of the kibbutzim uh, in the south that was targeted during the October 7th attack. And he was literally, tr they tried to block him and his, um, you know, uh, caravan of the, the envoys to, of coming in, the convoys. Um, they tried to block him and they told him he's not wanted there and that he dances on their blood. And so it's hard to overstate the anger and mistrust with this government. And so, you know, when October 7th happened, people said Netanyahu's over, it's done. Uh, but we see that it's not quite done yet. So the question is, you know, what will what will make that tip over? Uh, the tragedy uh, of being, three hostages being killed, I think, is one of those things. If this drags on for a long time, I, I, longer, I think Israelis will grow impatient. Uh, there's also always the prospect of Netanyahu's own Likud party. Uh, it would just take, I think, about five members deciding um, that he's no longer fit, and and you could do a non what's called like a a non confidence vote, um, which could also lead to a, a a rebuilding of the coalition. And opposition leader Yair Lapid has called for Netanyahu to step down. So uh, there's a lot of that happening. It's just that the trauma and the the wartime mood has made it very difficult. So to answer your question, it's hard to see it happening 
now in this intensity of conflict, but it 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 definitely could happen at some point, and it certainly seems like it will happen once the Gaza war is somehow diminished or in a different phase or ended. Okay, great, thank you. So I have two uh, questions for Tahani. Uh, the first um, is uh, about the popularity of Hamas. How popular has Hamas become amongst Palestinians? Um, and this comes, that question came from Laura uh, Mirakian, if I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. And the other question from Benjamin Carey is, uh, can you tell us more about the re-arrest of the Palestinian detainees that were freed during the ceasefire? Um, sure. So I'll, I'll start with the first question. Um, I mean, first of all, popular in comparison to what? <laughs> A, a dormant, ineffective PA um, that has been incapable of protecting its people, advocating for it diplomatically, doing very little um, to try and advocate for a ceasefire, um, has deliberately cut off salaries, not done much to assist in aid efforts. I mean, popular in comparison to what, given the scenes we're seeing come out of Gaza, of course, you know, an, an organization that claims to, well, the only organization that is uh, trying to offer a semblance of protection or pushback again for, for its own people. Um, but I think still it's very premature to, to gauge Hamas's popularity, especially in a place like Gaza, where the entire population is uh, in survival mode. I'm not even sure, to be quite frank, how this current opinion poll was even able to be conducted in a place like Gaza, given, um, again, you know, com complete restrictions and, and, and communication blackouts. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I would take that, um, with a bit of caution, I would say, but it's still very premature, um, to determine Hamas's popularity, but it's not uncommon in moments like this for Hamas's popularity to surge. But as I mentioned earlier, that's often to do with, um, its acts of resistance rather than any adherence to Hamas's political uh, ideology or as a governing authority. Uh, with regards to the arrests. Um, I mean, this isn't uncommon, you know, this was something that happened in 2011 uh, during the last prisoner swap between Hamas and Israel, where those that had been released were later re-arrested. Um, this was something that Palestinians themselves were very concerned about, the potential re-arrest, and there were no assurances in that truce or, or pause to guarantee that they wouldn't be re-arrested. Um, the Israeli prison system is almost like a revolving door for Palestinians, where in many cases they get uh, released and then re-arrested. So this isn't really something that's completely uncommon. If anything, many Palestinians did expect it. Yeah, uh, we uh, we outside as well didn't expect it either. Uh, Yost, um, there's a question. I don't know if you want to add on to what uh, Tahani was also commenting, um, uh, but there's a question about the Houthi attacks on the shipping lines in the Red Sea. Um, uh, if at all, do, do you know what the Gulf reactions uh, were uh, to those um, expressions of solidarity uh, with with Gaza? Um, could you elaborate a bit more on that, if possible? Um, sh sure. Um, well, uh, first of all, there has been a, uh, a massive popular uh, response to the war in Gaza with, you know, people in the Arab world, the Islamic world and beyond expressing uh, sympathy and support for the for the Palestinians in Gaza. Um, uh, and so um, that has meant that the authoritarian regimes in the Middle East uh, that have been reaching out to Israel for the last few years and that have normalized relations in some case or that were talking about normalizing relations uh, with Israel, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, have had to uh, scale down their their uh, the momentum of this. Um, uh, of course, those who have already those relations uh, are continuing and are quite intent on continuing those relations, but have to be less visible about it, less vocal about it. Uh, and Saudi Arabia has been has been remarkably quiet uh, about it all, knowing that it's public, which is you know it has a significant uh, population and uh, indigenous population as opposed to say the UAE, which has a lot of a uh, lot much larger proportion of expats in the country uh, than Saudi Arabia. But the Saudi government knows very well that it has to be very careful what it says and what it does. Um, it also realizes that uh, whereas before October 7th in these negotiations with the United States and, and with Israel, 
Um, uh, it had a number of demands, uh, mostly directed at the United States. Uh, and the question of Palestine was uh, at the bottom of the agenda. It was there, but it was uh, certainly not a priority. And I, I, it was clear that uh, the Saudi Arabia and others were quite willing to throw the Palestinian question under the bus. Um, I think that has changed. And now um, uh, they, uh, they know that they must, whether they like it or not, uh, move it to the top of the agenda. Now, what that means in practical terms is an open question because the war is ongoing, uh, but eventually there must be some return to a political process. Uh, we've already heard uh, from Tahani that a, a two-state solution, uh, all of the, these discussions are basically too little too late. Um, it is unclear that, that, that such a solution is still on the cards. Um, but uh, some kind of process certainly ought to happen. Uh, and, and I would imagine that the Saudi uh, government, is, along with other Arab states, would have to be part of that. Now, Saudi Arabia at the same time is trying to extract itself and its forces from Yemen and has been involved in peace talks with the, uh, with the Houthis in Yemen. Um, and so when the Houthis are, are firing rockets at commercial shipping in the Red Sea, which affects... Uh, uh, everybody along, along the border of the, of the Red Sea, but, but also the world economy, uh, of course, the Saudis are paying attention. At the same time, they don't want to do anything at the moment that would upset their talks with the Houthis and that would uh, prevent or would lead to the collapse of these talks so that a deal could not materialize at this stage because they're really quite keen, uh, to put it mildly, to, to withdraw uh, their troops from Yemen. Um, other Arab states also have to be careful because they are so upset at Israel over what it's doing in Gaza. So they're, they're in a way, they're not sympathetic to the Houthis, but also they don't want to stand up to the Houthis. So they're leaving it to the Western nations to counter the Houthis and to establish some kind of deterrence in the Red Sea. That's what we're seeing now. Um, so that's, let's leave Thank it at you. that. Thank you. So we've also seen expressions of support in the United States, not so much, not for what the Houthis are doing, uh, of course, uh, but expressions of support in the US uh, in favor of um, the Palestinians. There's a there's a question uh, on this from the audience. Uh, we've seen rallies, marches and activism like never before. Many of these are led by Jewish groups like Jewish Voices of Peace, if not now and others. How are they viewed in Israel? Is there a sense in Israel that American Jewish support for Israel might be waning, especially among the younger generation of Jews? Over to you, Mayra. Thanks. Thanks for the question. It's a good one. Um, Israel, you know, is largely, I think, sees, and the average Israeli and also the media specifically, um, I think sees these protests as threatening as anti-Israel, as even anti-Semitic. Um, and, you know, we've reached a point where, you know, for years, um, any kind of nonviolent uh, means to combat Israeli occupation, the boycott movement, um, nonviolent protests were rejected and in, in certain times even considered anti-Semitic in the US and in Israel. And what we're seeing now is that um, just the call for uh, solidarity with Gaza or any kind of pro-Palestinian uh, slogan of any kind. Now there are different kinds. You could, you know, um, interpret them differently. But on a whole, Israel sees this as threatening, as anti-Israel, and I think they're very, very concerned. And I know that there are Israelis who um, are wondering what kind of future and security they have in Israel. And when they think about where they would go, they don't always know because they feel like the Western world right now is also quite hostile to Israel. Um, you know, that also has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, it's I think it is hard for some people, uh, despite the disproportionate and, and the devastation of Gaza, I think it's hard for some people to to humanize Israelis at this point and understand what they went through on October 7th. And so it's and for them, it's about the larger conflict. It's about what Israel has done for for many, many decades, and it didn't start on October 7th. And I think for Israelis, it's very hard to understand that because they're dealing with their own trauma and that's what they see. Um, now, there are polls that show that younger American Jews are both more progressive as opposed to younger Israelis who are more right-wing, and also that Democrats are more uh, progressive and are more demanding um, of Biden and of, of their leadership that they take a, a greater stance on 
on America's role and support for Israel. So I think Israelis do understand that. I think, you know, reasonable, rational Israelis understand that that Netanyahu is has been and is um, making Israel a partisan issue and uh, is not helping Israel's interests as far as the U.S. Um, and that they will have to pay for that and that they need to be much more careful and clear about how they uh, deal with the U.S. in the future. So that that is a threat. But on a whole, I think Israelis are feeling very, very defensive um, about those protests. And it's interesting that we're seeing them even more so in, in Western states, I think, than in the Arab world, um, which is its own its own bag that I won't get into. We know why we don't have so many protests in the Arab world. Um, but uh, uh, I have uh, two two questions, I think, for, for Yos, but Tahani, feel free to, to jump in if you want. Uh, one is, um, what credibility is there that Iran did not green light the October 7th attack? Uh, is Iran part of the solution or the problem uh, to a two-state solution? So this is the first question. And then a second one, um, which is, I guess, a provocation here, if Israel is focused on eliminating Hamas and Hamas leaders, or at least one of them is in Qatar, what's the point of targeting Gaza? Uh, Yost, you and I were in Qatar recently, so maybe you can elaborate on the role of uh, Qatar in, in this whole situation. Thanks, Claudia. Yes, uh, of course. Um... So uh, on 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 Iran. Uh, sorry, what was the question on Iran? Uh, what the, uh, uh, what is the indication that Iran? That's a, yeah, that is the, no. Involved. Yeah. Well, uh, well. So so both Israeli and American uh, intelligence have said so, uh, that it is their assessment that uh, the Iranian leadership was caught off guard by October seventh. Um, so. Whether that's true or not, uh, I cannot confirm, of course, uh, but we've seen other signs of it. First of all, the Iranians were upset, publicly upset uh, uh, at Hamas for having uh, done it. Miffed, to put it, I mean, upset may be too strong a word, but indicated their, their disaffection with uh, with Hamas for doing so. Nasrallah, also uh, the head of, uh, of Hezbollah, uh, came out that way. Uh, certainly Hamas experienced it that way. So there was, there was clearly unease among the members of the axis of resistance about it all. Um, and and I think, you know, one reason why Hamas was so successful on October 7th in breaching uh, the security defense of Israel uh, was that it, uh, it held so closely the secret of its plans. Um, it may have been supported by Iran militarily, it may have received training, all signs are that, that, that all of this is true, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, Iran signed off on the attack itself at that time, uh, because Iran, again, has has uh, has its own interests in mind and not necessarily Hamas's in the Palestinian theater. So so that's one. Sorry, what was the second question about Iran? About about the role of Qatar. Somebody. Uh, no, sorry, there was a there was a part two to the Iran question. Uh, part two to the Iran question is: Is Iran part of the solution or the problem uh, in in leading the way to a two state solution? Well, well, first of all, the question is: What is the obstacle to a two state solution? And I would say it's Israeli settlements in the West Bank, um, and it's not any outside party, uh, whatever their identity. Um, Iran has said, whether we take that uh, seriously or not, but has said consistently over the years that it's up to Palestinians to decide what future they want and Iran would support that. Um, but so so that may be true or not be true, but uh, I, for now I would take their word uh, for it because anyway, it's not going anywhere. The um, And the other uh, part of that is, of course, that... Um, well, anyway, uh, I'll leave it at that for for the Iran question. Let's move on to Qatar. The um, the so the, uh, the the presence of of the political office of Hamas in Qatar is is a sore issue for uh, for many in Israel and in the United States. Um, and uh, Hamas moved there actually um, because uh, they uh, had to leave Syria in 2012 after the uh, popular uprising there. And um, and it was a question of where they would move, and and I think there was uh, some uh, um, you know understanding between Qatar and the United States that they could move to uh, to to Doha. Uh, that would have been that was was better than to have them move to Iran or another place 
where they could not be controlled. Now, um, what has become clear uh, and was already clear before October 7th, but and quite a bit written about it in the last few weeks, about how Hamas is also internally divided. And you have the, the wing in Gaza, which took the initiative for the October 7th attack, um, uh, and that is heavily uh, militarized. And it's, of course, it's under military occupation. And it's also a close, more closely linked to Iran, as opposed to the political leadership, which is in Qatar, also in uh, in Egypt, of course, and in other places, uh, which, which present, represents something in Hamas, but is not carrying the weight of the movement. And so uh, in the current negotiations, obviously, uh, with all the connections to, to Gaza being highly problematic, uh, uh, Qatar uh, and Turkey and Egypt are all speaking to, to the Hamas political leadership in exile. Ismail Haniyeh is in Egypt today, for example, uh, to talk about another hostage release deal. It is not Yahya Senwar or Mohammed Dave or any of the other Ga uh, Hamas leaders in Gaza who are doing these negotiations. They cannot. So we'll have to see in the end whether Hamas can come to a, to a unified decision on anything at this point. Uh, but, um, but certainly uh, Qatar has come under criticism uh, for having hosted Hamas under current circumstances and uh, may well yet come to a reckoning uh, once all of this is over, if we come to that stage or if we find a time when we can actually define what over means. Great, thank you. I don't know if Tahani, if you want to add anything else. No, okay. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if for Tahani or or Mayraf, if any of you have more news or details about the reported flooding of the Gaza tunnels with sea water. Um, is that happening, uh, or is that was was that a false report? And uh, um, what will be the environmental impact uh, of this uh, of this war and the destruction? I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything beyond the reports. There was a report in Israel um, that they did a pilot, uh, that they've set up the infrastructure and they did like some kind of pilot and that it was successful. I don't know where, I don't know what that means. And I, you know, I have a sense that this is something that is not actually going to be fully enacted, but I really have no idea. Okay. But again, Claudia, this this would be again sort of put on the forefront the the dilemma that Mayraf mentioned earlier about the Israeli dual objectives and whether they are reconcilable. One is to destroy Hamas. You could do it by maybe I'm not sure, but by flooding the tunnels, and the other one is to to rescue the hostages by flooding the tunnels. Theoretically, possibly, you would also kill the hostages. Right, Tahani, you want to add? Yeah, um, it's not really clear how effective that is or will be. Um, and Hamas have already said that they have countermeasures in place if Israel does attempt um, any any proper like systematic process of, of doing so. Uh, we have another question um, for Tahani. Can you speak about the chances of Marwan Barghouti uh, playing an active role in Palestinian politics? Is this complete fantasy? Um, I mean, it wasn't fantasy about two years ago during the election buildup. Uh, but what made Marwan popular at that time was the fact that he had garnered the protest vote. He was really the only viable alternative to Mahmoud Abbas, especially given that at the time, uh, during that reconciliation deal that was meant to be um, where elections were a process of that, uh, Hamas had refused to frontline its own candidate for presidency. Um, Today, I mean, Marwan Barghouti isn't really uh, a major name that is being mentioned when we think about post-war governance right now, or even um, in discussions for, for, for potential change in, 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 in the Palestinian political space. Um, so I think his, his relevance has somewhat declined since. Okay, thank you. And I think keep, one last keep in word... mind. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Keep keep in mind, Miklady doesn't. Oh, sorry, Tahani didn't say it, but because it's so obvious to her. Uh, but Marwan Barouzi is in prison. Right. Yes. He still he he would need to come out uh, first. Um, uh, so we have just, I think, one last minute. Uh, Mayreb, I'm not sure if you can uh, stay with us for one minute or you have to rush out. But I have one last question uh, about the region, Yoast. Um, 
uh, does Saudi Arabia or Qatar have leverage in influencing or or, or contributing to a ceasefire? Uh, the idea being that Israel has an interest to keep its door open with these Arab countries. Yeah, I think there is some leverage there, um, but um, you, you know, uh, uh, but it's very limited, and the reason is is simple because um, um, they Israel realizes that if it gives something to uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, for example, by implementing a ceasefire uh, at their request, um, uh, apart from any request from the United States, which would be much more amount of pressure, um, it would have to it have to do there would have to be a quid pro quo, and that quid pro quo would be the return to a political process that could potentially lead toward or in the direction of a two-state solution, if such is still possible. And we also know that this Israeli government, or I suspect a successor one, it would be is adamantly opposed to a two-state solution. So um, in that sense, they, they don't want to listen to Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates. And they're probably, Israel is probably counting that in the long term, those countries just want to benefit from relations with Israel on the other fronts, economic surveillance, uh, technology, uh, you know, and 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 being in the good graces with the United States. Thank you, and I think with that uh, we'll have to uh, end this webinar. There are a lot of questions and remarks uh, as well, and I'm sorry we couldn't answer um, uh, everybody's questions. Um, um, but I wanted to thank Tahani, Yoz Meirav, who had to leave, um, Teresa, uh, Christina, who are supporting us in the background, and our translator, uh, Mirna, uh, for, for the live translation. I think um, uh, it was great that we could offer Arabic translation uh, this time, and hopefully we'll continue uh, in future webinars. So thank you again, uh, and thank you for your questions.